Uh, well, the first uh, question that I want to make is from, uh, is to you guys. Uh, you, uh, what's your name? Antonio. Antonio, how old are you? 20. 20, okay. There's a very interesting thing about our first speaker, because our first speaker has more experience than you have of years lived. <laughs> Basically, he has a uh, great, great experience. He has over 37 years of experience. So, well, when you were a baby, he was already working on this field. So, please give a round of applause to Dave, our first speaker. Okay. Hola, Lisboa. O meu nome. O meu nome é Dave Aronson, so o T-Rex de Codosaurus e voy aqui no meio pterodáctilo de esta mesal para vos ensinar a matar mutantes. Mas vou fazê-lo em inglês. So what on infinite earths is the big difference between mutation testing and all the other software testing techniques? The big difference is that mutation testing, excuse me, that most of the others are about checking whether our software is correct. But mutation testing is checking for two other qualities and assumes that our software is correct. In my opinion, the more important of these two other qualities is that our test suite is strict. And to check this, a mutation testing tool will try to find the gaps that let our code get away with unintended behavior. Once we find these gaps, we can fill them in by either adding more tests or by expanding and improving any existing tests that might be suitable. Lack of this strictness usually comes from lack of tests or poorly written tests or occasionally poorly maintained tests that didn't keep pace with changes in the code. The other thing it checks for is that our code is what I call meaningful, by which I mean that any tiny little semantic change, as opposed to strictly syntactic or structural, will have a noticeable effect on the behavior of the code. Lack of meaning, or lack of meaningfulness if you're not into the whole brevity thing, generally comes from code being unreachable or redundant or otherwise just not having any real effect. When we find meaningless code, we can figure out why it's meaningless and either make it meaningful if that suits our purposes, but the usual fix is to just remove it. Mutation testing puts these two together by checking that every tiny little change that the tool knows how to make will indeed have a noticeable effect on the behavior of the code and that our test suite is strict enough to notice that change and fail. Now, not all the tests have to fail, mind you, but every change should make at least one test fail. Now that's the upside, but as Fred Brooks told us back in 1986, there's no silver bullet. Besides which, those are for killing werewolves, not mutants. The first drawback is that it's rather hard labor on the CPU, and therefore usually rather slow. We certainly won't want to mutation test our entire code base. I got disco lights going. We won't want to mutation test our entire code base every time we save a file, you know, maybe over a lunch break for a fairly small system or perhaps a weekend for a larger one. Fortunately, most of, them, most of these tools do come with ways to tell, you know, only bother checking this function, this class, this file, and so on. And most of them come with some kind of incremental mode. Oops. Hmm. Oh, it's just taken a while to catch up. Hello. There we go, incremental mode, so that it can just look at what changed since the last git commit, the last time we ran this tool, or the difference from the main branch. Combining those filters, maybe we can come up with something that we can actually mutation test every time we save a file, or at least over a much shorter break. Another drawback is that it's often not at all clear what to do about the results. 
it tells us that some change to the code made no difference whatsoever to the test results. But what does that even mean? It takes a lot of mental effort to figure out what a surviving mutant is trying to tell us. It's usually saying that our code is meaningless or our tests are lax, but it can, be, it can take quite a lot of effort to figure out exactly how. Worse yet, sometimes it's a false alarm and the change might not have made any tests fail, but that's often because it didn't make any real difference in the behavior in the first place. And even if a mutation does make a difference, most programs contain a lot of code that we just shouldn't bother to test, like a debugging log trace. There we go. Fortunately, most of the tools have ways to say, just don't bother mutating this line or this function, this class, whatever. But that's usually with comments, which can clutter up the code and make it a little less readable. So how does this work, unlike this guy? Mutation testing mutates copies of our code, hence the name. And it does this with the intention of creating test failures, otherwise known as faults. So mutation testing is classified as a fault-based testing technique. And this means it's related to something you might already know about, Chaos Monkey from Netflix. But the way mutation testing works is sort of upside down from, go on, it'll get there eventually. It's upside down from what Chaos Monkey does. Chaos Monkey is best known for injecting faults like latency and jitter into Netflix's production network. There we go, just in time for the next slide. Yeah, production network. And if all still goes well, in the sense that Netflix's customers don't notice and their metrics still look good, then Netflix knows that their error recovery is working great. Mutation testing, however, injects semantic changes. It doesn't know if these changes, come on, change, are going to cause faults or not. We certainly hope they all will, but that's up to the test suite. And it injects them into copies of our code, not our actual network. And it does this in our test environment, not production. Whew. And if all still goes well, in the sense that our tests all still pass, that doesn't mean everything's fine. That means there is a problem. Remember, Every change should make at least one test fail. Mutation testing has also been compared to fuzzing, a security penetration technique involving throwing lots of random data at an application. But mutation testing is sort of like fuzzing the code rather than the data, and it's also not random. But enough about differences. What does mutation testing actually do and how? Let's start with a high-level view. First, a mutation testing tool will break our code apart into pieces to test. Usually, these will be our functions. Then for each one, it finds the tests that cover each function and then makes mutants from that function. And to do that, it looks closely at the function to see how it can be changed. And for each way it can see to change that, that function, the tool makes one mutant with that mutation. And once it's done creating all the mutants it can for a given function, then it iterates over that list. List, it'll get there eventually. And then we get to the heart of the concept, which I'll skip to another slide, there we go. For each mutant derived from a given function, yeah, I have to look and make sure it's keeping up. It runs the function's tests, but it runs them against the current mutant rather than the original function. Now, most of the tools don't give us anywhere near all this information, let alone so neatly organized. But there's a conceptual model that I use to help explain the point. If any test fails, this is called killing the mutant, and it's a good thing. It means that our code is meaningful enough that the tiny little mutation that the tool made in order to create this mutant 
had a noticeable effect on the behavior of the code, and that our test suite was strict enough that at least one test would notice that change and fail. Then the tool will mark that mutant killed, stop running any more tests against it, and move on to the next one. But if a mutant lets all the tests pass, then that mutant is said to have survived. And that means it has the superpower of mimicry, skilled enough to fool our tests. Now let's peel back one layer of the onion. Whoops, yeah, there we go, one layer of the onion, and look at some technical details of how this works. First, our tool will parse our code, usually into an abstract syntax tree, so that this code becomes this abstract syntax tree. Come on, plant the tree. Well, anyway, it's gonna show an abstract, there we go, an abstract syntax tree. I'm gonna assume you're all familiar with the concept of an AST, but don't worry about actually understanding this one in detail. Then it traverses that tree, looking for the subtrees that represent our functions. And after finding one, it looks for the tests, which I'm going to completely gloss over how. Then it makes the mutants. And to make mutants from an AST subtree that represents a function, it traverses that, just like it did to the whole big thing. But now, instead of looking for even smaller subtrees, like twigs or something, to extract, it's looking for nodes where it can change something. And each time it finds one, then for each way it knows how to change that node, it'll make a copy of that function subtree with just that one little mutation in it. For instance, suppose our tool has started traversing this function subtree, part of that AST I showed you earlier, and it's gotten down to this if statement. For each way the tool knows how to change that node, it'll make a fresh copy of this whole subtree with just that node changed in that one tiny little way. After it's done making all the mutants it can by changing that node, it'll continue on to the next node and do likewise to that one and so on until it's uh, traversed the entire tree. It'll get there eventually. Now, I've been talking a lot about changing things, so what sort of changes are we talking about? There are quite a lot. It can change a mathematical, logical, there we go, you can see some of the reflection in the window back there. Uh, it'll, it can change a mathematical, logical, or bitwise operator from one to another, even going into a different category when the language and situation allows. For instance, in many languages, we can treat anything as a Boolean. So x times y might become x and y, or x bitwise exclusive or y. It can change the order of operands in cases where they matter. It could change a comparison from one to another. It could insert or remove a logical, mathematical, or bitwise negation. It can remove an if condition so that something that might be skipped over or done is always done. Similarly, it could remove a looping condition so that something that might be skipped over, done once, or done multiple times is always done once. It could change a value from its existing value to some other value, like changing 42 to any of these and many more, and, but I, I had to stop somewhere. It could even change it to a completely incompatible type, like changing a number into a, if I may quote Smeagol, string or nothing. Ah, somebody got it, thank you. <laughs> there are many, many more types of changes, but I trust you get the idea by now. So let's peel back one last layer of the onion and look at some pseudocode that, that illustrates how this process works. Uh, we're not gonna stop to inspect and unpack this, but the final slide contains the URL for all the slides. That's the same one I told you at the beginning had the slides you can download. So then you can take a picture of the final slide and ponder this and the rest of them at your leisure. So now let's walk through some examples. 
We'll start with a simple one. Suppose we have a function like this. Never mind why, it just makes a good, simple introductory example. Think about what a mutant made from this might return, since it doesn't look like it would have side effects. Mainly a mutant could return results such as any of these values, and again, many more, but I had to stop somewhere. Now suppose we had only one test, like so. This is a rather bad test, but even so, it would kill most of those mutants, the ones shown here in crossed out green. But addition, multiplication, and exponentiation in the reverse order all get us the right answer. So a mutant based on those mutations would survive our test. Oh, forgot to, forgot to circle that. All right, a report from a mutation testing tool might present them to us as something like this. The exact format of the report will vary enormously depending exactly which tool we we'll use. As you'll see later, there are lots. Now, the question is, what is this set of surviving mutants trying to tell us? Since our code is so short, it's quite unlikely to be redundant or unreachable code. So it's probably a gap in our test suite. So how did that happen? The usual cause is that the mutant returns the same value as the original function, or has the same side effect if that's what our tests are looking at. To determine how that happens, it helps to take a closer look at one mutant and a test it passes. <clears throat> So let's start with the plus mutant. Looking at this change together with our test makes it much clearer that this one survives because two plus two equals two to the two. Come on, I'll get there, there we go. Two plus two equals two to the two, two to two, two to two, two to two. And so does two times two, but he's in the background. We can save him for later. So how can we kill this mutant in other words, make at least one test fail when run against this mutant, but succeed when run against the original code. We need to make at least one test use inputs so that x plus y is different from x to the y, fairly simple. For instance, we could add a test or change our unfortunately currently only test to something like this, asserting that Hello, asserting that two to the fourth power is 16. All the mutants that our original test killed, this would still kill. But also two plus four is six, not 16. So this kills the plus mutant. You see how that works? Okay, even better, two times four is eight, which is also not 16. We devs should certainly know our powers of two at least that well. So this kills the times mutant as well. You'll find that killing one mutant often kills others as well. But the pair of argument swapping mutants still survive. But that's okay, we can attack them separately. No need to kill them all in one shot and be some kind of superhero about it. To kill the argument swapping mutants, we can Again, either add a test or adjust an existing test to maybe something like this. This asserting like this, ahem. Well, I'll just describe it anyway. Asserting that two, there we go, to the third power equals eight. If we reverse those, three squared is nine, not eight. So this kills the argument swapping mutants. But better yet, two plus three is five, two times three is six. Both of those are not eight. So the plus and times mutants stay dead and we don't get any zombie mutants wandering around, even if this were still our one and only test. Hello. With these inputs, the correct operation is the only simple common one that gets us the correct answer. So this isn't the only solution. Now, there are lots of ways to skin that flurkin. Now this may make mutation testing sound simple, so let's look at a more complex example. 
Hello. There we go. Suppose we had a function to send a message, like so. This function send message uses send bytes to send as many bytes as it can, looping to pick up where it left off last time until the message is all sent. A very common pattern in communication software. Now, a mutation testing tool could make lots and lots of mutants from something like this, but one of particular interest would be this. Removing those lines with the minus signs that I've dimmed, that'd be an example of removing a loop control. Now, suppose that this mutant does indeed survive our test suite, but even without seeing the tests, what would that tell us? If a mutant that only goes through that loop once acts the same as our normal code, there we go, as far as our tests can tell, then that means that our tests are only making our normal code go through that loop once. So what does that mean? You'll find that interpreting mutants involves a lot of asking yourself, so what does that mean? Often deeply recursively. In this case, it means we're not testing with a message big enough to make it go through that loop multiple times. In other words, bigger than send bytes can send in one chunk. So how did that happen? There are lots and lots of ways, but the most likely is we just didn't bother. For instance, we have a maximum chunk size of 10,000, and yet we're only testing with a tiny little three byte message. The obvious fix is to just deliberately use a bigger message. And with this assumed setup, we can make one trivially, just take the chunk size, add one, make that big a message, and away we go. But let's look at another possible cause. Maybe we did test with the largest permissible message, or at least message size. For instance, here we have, and here we have, well, we will soon have small and large message sizes. And we test with a large, there we go. And yet that mutant survives. In other words, we're st still sending the message in one chunk. But what could possibly be wrong with that? What, what is this mutant trying to tell us in this scenario? In this case, it's trying to tell us that a version of send message with the looping removed will do the job just fine. If we remove the looping, and then everything that was there only to support the looping, we wind up with this. And now it's very clear what the ultimate message is, that send message may well be redundant and we can just use send bytes directly. Now in real world code, it might not be because we might have some error handling and uh, logging and so forth that we need in send message, but at least the looping was redundant. Fortunately, when it's this kind of problem, the fix is very easy, just rip out whatever it was that the mutant didn't have. This will also make our code more maintainable by getting rid of useless cruft that's just getting in the way of our understanding it. So now that we've seen some examples of spotting bad tests and redundant code, I'd like to address some common questions. First. This whole idea sounds pretty weird. Deliberately making tests fail to prove that the code succeeds. Where did this bizarro idea come from in the first place? Mutation testing has a surprisingly long history, at least in the context of computers. It was first proposed in 1971 in a term paper by Richard Lipton titled, Fault Diagnosis of Computer Programs. The first tool appeared in 1980 as part of Timothy Budd's PhD work. But it still wasn't practical on consumer grade or even developer grade machines until maybe about 2000 or so with faster CPUs, multi-core CPUs, larger, faster, cheaper memory, and so forth. And that leads us to the other main question, why does it need so much resources? With some reasonable-ish assumptions about our code, we can guesstimate that mutation testing will often need about 200 times as many test runs as just running our test suite. So if our test suite normally takes a zippy 10 seconds, then mutation testing will take 
over 33 minutes. Yeah, well over half an hour. I don't know about you, but I don't want to sit there and wait for that. So to sum up, mutation testing is a powerful technique to check that our code is meaningful and our tests are strict. It's fairly easy to get started with once we understand the concept and have chosen a tool and configured it and so forth, but it's not so easy to interpret the results, nor is it easy on the CPU. And even if these drawbacks mean it's not very well suited for our current projects right now, I think it's still just a really cool idea in a geeky kind of way. If you'd like to try it for yourself, here's a list of the tools for many, many languages and platforms. I know it's much too small to read, but again, the final slide has the URL for all the slides and, by the way, a complete script, which I've mostly stuck to. But before we get to that, I'd like to give a shout out to TopTal. This is uh, their logo. It's a consulting network I'm in. Please use that uh, partly hidden, darn it, uh, URL if you want to hire us or join us. The anchor part, except only candid coders down there, tells them it's me. And if you actually do hire us or work a project through us, uh, good try. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, then we both get some bounty, yeah. And now here's that promised, here will shortly be that promised final slide with uh, that URL for the slides and many more. And it'll be your turn for questions. There we go. Ah, yes, the final word on that is slides there. Codus Aureus, Reds, Mutants, Gambi, 22 slides. Okay, Any, yes, a question. Uh, let me just grab the mic here so that everyone can hear from YouTube as well. And I'll go back and forth. <laughs> go ahead. Okay, so I wanted to ask what is the most common area that people use this kind of tool? Because uh, particularly I'm an iOS developer and it's hard enough to make people care about tests. And test the test is something even beyond that. So uh, I would like to know if you use this in your daily job, and which areas do you recommend if I want to, to use this? Because honestly, getting it into iOS would be too hard for me right now, only myself. Okay, I could just hold that by now. Okay, if I understand correctly what the main question is, what sort of software does one generally use this on. Uh, pretty much anything where the quality, at least the, the correctness and how thorough your test suite is, is going to be important. I would say most of the stuff that's uh, visual effects on the front end, yeah, that's going to change with fashions and whatnot and isn't usually terribly important. But your business logic, anything handling money, uh, that's where you want to make sure that your tests are strict and this will help you with that. And I can't speak particularly to iOS or other mobile development. I've only done a tiny smidge of that. Okay, next question. All right, I guess we're done. Okay, thank you very much, Dave.